Okay, good afternoon everyone. Um, so today we will continue uh, working on uh, solutions of the time-independent Schrodinger equation. And essentially what we are going to answer is the following type of question. Um, let us consider a potential for simplicity in one dimension, which looks something like this. This is x, and this goes to infinity, so it's essentially a small well or a trap. Um, now, in classical mechanics, uh, we know that if the system is dissipative, that is, it loses energy because of some friction, uh, there is an energy state where the particle has a minimum of energy, and this state will be here. That's the lowest lying state. Now, we know already that in quantum mechanics, the particle cannot be localized in one space, one spot, because then the uncertainty in its position will be zero. That means that its momentum uncertainty will be infinite, and that means that its energy will be infinite. So we know that the wave function in the steady state, in the lowest energy state, is somehow spread out. We actually know maybe it looks like this. Uh, Another thing that we know from uh, classical mechanics is that there are many states inside this well that can exist in principle. What do I mean by that? If you have a low energy, which is an energy below this threshold, you can have many states inside. You can have a particle here, you can have a particle in different energy states. How many of them? actually infinite number of them. That's why you even, when you study classical mechanics, you don't ask the question how many states you have there. There's infinite number of states in the sense that all energy levels are possible here in classical because the energy is a continuum in classical mechanics. Now what we're going to ask, a, a, a question in a quantum mechanics, which cannot be asked at all in classical mechanics, is the following. Let's say we have such a binding, I call this a binding potential, because it can bound the particle. What does it mean, bound the particle? In the classical sense, it's in the trap, and then it cannot go to infinity. That means this trap is catching you. For example, consider you have a surface of some atoms, and then there's one, at uh, one particle, uh, let's say, positively charged in the middle, and then you have a negative particle. It is trapped by this potential well. So it's a trapping or binding binding thing. A particle which is up here in energy is not bounded. Why not? Because it can go, lose its uh, potential energy and move it to kinetic energy or gain kinetic energy and then go to infinity. So it's not bounded. So all the classical particles with energy below this level are bounded and all those above are non-bounded. That's trivial from classical mechanics. But now the question is, and this is our question, let's say you have a quantum system like this, and you have this, uh, this minima of potential or this uh, attraction. This is an attraction, attracting force. Why is it attracting? Because the force acts in both ways to this point, right? So it's an attracting force. The question is, is there always a bound state? Is there always, for example, a ground state? Maybe there is, and maybe there isn't. We don't know the answer. Why is this important? Imagine that you have here in the room, you have, let's say, two atoms. That's a much more complicated problem than what we are going to solve. But imagine that they are attracting. Nearly any atom in the two atoms you take will attract at some, some distances, at least. These atoms are not like hard spheres that always repel. They're, if you bring them close enough, they are trapped. Now, in classical mechanics, if the energy is low enough, you have two attracting particles, what will happen to them? They will bind. They will come into a molecule. And then if you have many of these attracting objects, they will bind together, provided that the energy is low enough that they, so to say, fall into this well or you don't have enough kin kinetic energy. So let us assume that you, know, you are really at low energies. What would that mean? That would mean that all the atoms will go and, if they are attracting, 
in the lowest energy state, they will come in and collapse one on top of the other. They will form a gigantic molecule. That's not so good for chemistry in your life because it means all attracting objects necessarily come together at least at low enough energies. Luckily, we are, this problem you really need to treat as quantum mechanics. And then what happens is that even if you have two particles that are attracting, not necessarily they can form a molecule. And that's what you know from real uh, life. That is, if you have two atoms, they're not necessarily, even though they attract, they do not necessarily have a minimum of energy in such a way that they combine together. And the reason is that in this picture, you have discrete energy levels, as we will show here inside. But sometimes the number of levels is zero. If this is, let's say, if this is very weak, let's say you have something. So, in a classical sense, inside here you have infinite sense, but maybe you can expect that here, in a, in a quantum world, there will be no state bounded here inside. And then all the states are unbounded, then you are not tied, and then not all molecules, or not all atoms are forming pairs. What we will show is that in one dimension, if you have such a potential, you have at least one state. No matter how small is this depth, how, no matter if this is very, uh, the, the depth is very small, so you kind of expect if this depth is small, do you expect more states inside? What do we mean by that? If I have something very big, you expect many energy levels inside. Quantum energy levels. If it's very small, well, now you don't know how many can be there. Maybe there'll be one, maybe there'll be two, maybe there'll be none. I'm telling you the end result, at least one. At least one in one dimension. In three dimensions, it will be shown more later towards the end of the course that in principle, you can have zero or not. It doesn't mean that you have zero, but you can have zero if the potential is low enough. This means that in one dimension, if let's say this is a surface, and you see this very small dip here, and if you put a particle in here, and it goes to its lowest energy, it will be bound to this place. It will be localized and be found here for sure, in its lowest energy level, like a classical particle that finds its lowest energy minimum. But in three dimensions, this will not be the case. Okay, this is just uh, some motivation to what we are going to do. But now let's simply do it, and we're not going to do it in the most general mathematical way, but we are going to treat it as, a, as one problem. And because I like piecewise square-like potentials, I'm going to use this type of potential. So this is my potential. It's V of X in one dimension. Um, here, this is the x direction, this is minus a, and this is plus a, so this point is zero. And the depth here is v0. I can play with the parameters. I can make a big, so a big trap will maybe many states inside, or maybe less, we will see. v0, the deeper you are, you expect more trap, more uh, states inside, etc. If V0 goes to minus infinity, that will be like the particle in the infinite well. Here the potential is zero for simplicity. Okay, so how do I solve this problem? And my, my solu what I'm looking for is the solution of the st st stationary Schrodinger equation. So I'm looking for the eigenstates, phi n, and energy states, in principle, of this problem. And what does it mean, a bound state? What is a bound state? How will I define it? If I draw on a blackboard a bound state, how will you know it's a bound state? What does it mean? Well, it mo means two things. Do you know what it means? I more or less said it. Can you... Can you how do you know that, the, how will you define a bound state in quantum mechanics? What does it mean? I mean, mathematically. Its energy is lower 
So yes, yeah, so, so this means that one uh, energy of the state, let's look at the ground state. The ground state is the lowest energy state that you have here, is less than zero. So because this potential is zero up here and here, this is a choice, I could choose any concept that I wanted. So energy, energy lowing below here is what I call a bound state. So this is a one way to define it, and this is totally identical to the classical definition. If the energy is below this depth, then okay, then you are bound. But if you think about it, how, how does the wave function more or less look like without solving this problem? We have this potential, and let's say I have a potential which looks maybe something like A wave function looks like this. Is this a bound state or not? So you can characterize the boundedness also uh, according to the behavior of the wave function far away from the well. So what do we expect? We expect that the ground state, for example, how will it look like? Okay, it will look like something like this. And then it will decay. It will decay here maybe exponentially. We'll see exactly how it decays. So far away the particle cannot be at all. So the, this decay of the wave function at plus and minus infinity is another uh, manifestation of the boundedness of the particle. It's different than a classical mechanics problem where the particle can be only inside here. So here the quantum particle can also penetrate into the region. So a classical mechanical particle is bounded in the sense it can be between A and minus A. In quantum mechanics, no. It can go and penetrate into this region, which is the forbidden region classically. The wave function, or let's say, of the ground state can decay here. But still it's decaying. It's decaying and not oscillating, for example. So if it's decaying, we say, okay, this is a bound state because eventually it will go to zero. You cannot really found it at plus and minus infinity. So this will be a characterization of boundedness. And this part, so this is non-bound. Picture of non-bound, this is bound. <coughs> Some decaying eigenstates. And this region, what is this effect that you see here? The particle, in probability sense, in the ground state, can be found in a region where classically it's not allowed, because classically the particle can be only here. Dang dang, it goes like that, right? It cannot be here. So this region is a, an effect that you studied already. This is called tunneling. This uh, motion or uh, the fact that you can find the particle inside the forbidden region classically is the effect of tunneling. Of course, this is different than the tunneling that we studied in the previous lesson. What did we study in the previous lesson? We had some incoming wave, and then it went through op opposite the barrier, and then it was reflected or transmitted. Here, we are not talking about a scattering experiment, where you inject particles in, and they are reflected or transmitted. In fact, here, we have a bound state that we don't have any time we don't have a current coming in, we don't have a current going out, etc. So, so here we're just looking at the steady state, at the stationary state, but still you are in a region which is not allowed and this is called tunneling amplitude into the forbidden region. And it's the same effect but very different because the boundary conditions here are different. Okay, so let us solve this problem. Everyone understands what is the problem? The, f the problem is to find the energy levels in principle and to see whether or not you have at all bounded states. So uh, we will divide the system into three. And how did I divide it from right to left? So this region is one, this region is two, and really this region is three. This is from minus A to minus infinity. Um, I'm also going to define, let's do it also here. Let's say you have a state inside here. I'm going to define this distance to the state, the, let's say the lowest state, 
as minus epsilon. So epsilon is going to be positive. V0 is positive. I, I just want epsilon to be positive, but remember the energy is minus epsilon. So epsilon will be a positive quantity all along. V0 is, a, is also positive, even though the, the energy is minus V0 here just for convenience, and it just means that if this E will eventually in the calculation turn out to be negative, then your energy is up here. Just you switch the side. So we want to show that, that you have solutions with energy, this epsilon greater than zero. So in this case, the Schrodinger equation looks like minus H squared over 2M um, the second derivative with respect to X plus V of X, which is this square well potential uh, trap, phi of X, and here I have minus epsilon phi of X. This is simply the usual energy that I had here, this energy, but I say I now measure it in minus sign, so just remember that I can do this, it's not a problem at all. So now we're going to start in the region one, Um, that is x greater than a. So we are now on the right-hand side here. So the solution of this equation is very simple because the potential is zero. The potential is zero, and then I have this uh, derivative, and I have this minus here. And then it's, uh, okay, we can write it. phi equal minus epsilon phi. This is the energy that I'm looking for. I want to know what is this energy. So that's why I had minus, and you see the minus and the minus, okay. They separate, and then this is in region one. So let us add here the index one. So phi one <laughs> is going to be C one exponential of minus square root 2me x over h bar. Why? Because if I take the second derivative with respect to x, I'll get here 2me over h bar squared, and they will cancel out, and you see now why it's convenient to have here the minus epsilon, because if I had just energy, then I'd have to put here absolute value all the time, so this is a bit nicer. And this is uh, not really, uh, I think, not really new because you had similar solutions that decay exponentially. This comes about because here you are on a flat. So it means that the decay here is exponential. Exponential, I mean, in x. There is a prefactor, some number C1, that in principle we would like to know, and we will get it later, but remember, till now we don't know this energy. Uh, does it exist? What will happen if the energy will be negative? What does this mean? It means that the solution is oscillati oscillating, and that means that you are up here, and then you are not bound at all. Here I already used the boundary condition. What is the boundary condition? That at x equal to infinity, the wave function has to decay because there is another solution without this minus but with a plus. Yes, but with a plus then the wave function will be infinity at uh, x to infinity and that will be not normalizable so I'm already using this fact that I cannot get an exploding, uh, exponentially exploding solution up here. Now I want to solve this problem. Now let us just think how you would solve it. I mean, wh wh what am I going to do? You saw something similar in previous lessons. So what do I need to do now? What do I need to do? Yeah, someone? Check for the other regions. Of course, check for the other reasons, uh, regions, correct. And how many solutions will I have here? I mean, what will be the solutions? What are the type of solutions in the middle? Am I looking for? There are two solutions, first of all, in the middle, so we will show, but what type of them? They are going to be also decaying exponentially, or what? What are they going to be here inside? You have some energy above this thing. 
these are going to be some oscillating solution, and here I'm going to have another another wave function, right, which is decay. So how many how many uh, unknowns do I have in this problem? I have uh, this uh, C1. I have two coefficients here in the middle, and I have another one here, and then I have the energy, right? So this is already some mess. But I taught you last lesson how to avoid this mess. What is the idea? I can use the fact that this field is symmetric. So what we are going to use, we're going to use the fact that V of X is V of minus X. That's why I put it exactly on the point of symmetry. This is zero. The potential here and here are exactly the same as you go far away from the origin. And this means that I have solutions, phi n of x, which are either, either, either uh, even or odd. Either plus vx or v minus x. These are even solutions. And these are odd. This is a theorem that I taught you a previous lesson to remind you. I told you that if the potential is even, that is in, in, like in our case, then you can always find solutions which are even and you can find solutions which are odd. What we are going to do is, let's say we are interested in the ground state or the even state. So, so what you do in this type of problems, you look for solutions which are totally even. And then you look for solutions which are totally odd. This just reduces the algebra very, very, very much. If you don't do this type of tricks, you are bound to make a mistake in your calculation unless you are very careful and you have a lot of time, which usually you don't in an exam. So this comes very, very uh, handy uh, in reducing the algebra because let's say I'm, I want to look at the even solutions. I don't need to do any math now. So let us look at even solutions. I found the wave function that decays exponentially here. What does it do here? Exactly the same thing. And if I look at the odd solution, it will be the same but with a minus sign. So what I'm trying to say here, essentially, I can look at this part and say I can only solve on half, and then I have actually one boundary condition, which means I have only two to match only two, two, two coefficients, essentially. Very, very economical. So we are going to look at these uh, even states. Anyone has any idea why I, I, why I look at the even state? The first, I mean, ah, in principle, I should look also on the odd states, but why I want to, why do I kind of maneuver you to the even states and not to the odd states? Because the ground state is even? Yeah, exactly. So I, I know I have this, uh, very good, I have this uh, potential, and I, I know from in physical intuition that the ground state looks something like this. I know this based on the examples I solved in, uh, let's say, the infinite well, and I know that the more I have these curvy, like oscillate, uh, like a turning point of, of, of the wave function, I have more momentum because the derivative is bigger, so I know that the even state, if I'm a good physicist, and if I know this, um, just when you look at the problem enough time, then you know this, but if you're a mathematician, you can prove this, but we won't do that because there's no need. So we know that the ground state is an even state, and as I said before, my goal is actually to focus on the existence of a, at least one state, uh, let's say for very small uh, depth here. So it's natural, let us look uh, 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 first at the even states. So we look at the even states, And then let us go now and be explicit. Now we're going to region two. So again, region two was in the middle. Oops. So you had region one, you had region two, you had region three. 
Vijayan Chu is here in the middle, um, <coughs> where you have uh, the following equation. Um, I'm multiplying the Schrodinger equation and um, moving the writing it maybe a slightly different way. You see, usually in Schrodinger equation, I have the second derivative in space multiplied by h squared over 2m. So this is actually, the, comes from kinetic energy term, the second derivative in space. This is the energy that uh, was on, the, on one side and I moved everything to the other side. And this, uh, here I have minus, v, minus v0, so this I already moved to the other side. So. This is exactly the Schrodinger equation in this uh, region. And in this region, I have uh, phi 2. OK, in generality, I have C2 plus um, cosine um, 2m v minus epsilon square root x over h bar plus C2 minus sine 2m v minus epsilon x over h bar. This is again easy to see because when I take the second derivative of the sine or the cosine, I'll get minus this junk here. And this junk here, I just take the square root and I put it inside here. So this is a very simple differential equation. And this is what I do when I don't know the solution. And here I have a plus. Why is this the plus? Because cosine function, this is the even part. Even. This is odd. Because sine of minus x is equal to minus sine of x. So this is the odd part. So what do I know from the theorem? I know that for some states, this guy will be finite. This guy will be 0 and the opposite or even states, I can choose one of them only. But if I didn't know this, then I had to do all this and then finally get that one of them is going to be zero. So here I don't need to do that, I can, I can use this. Finally, let us go to region three. So, as I said before, it's exactly like the positive part, but now I'm negative, so here I have exponential of 2me h bar x. Remember, x here is negative, so because you are below zero, so you see that x minus infinity this decays to zero. That's why you have a plus here. This is the solution that solves the boundary condition, which means that a decay here. And here I have some c3, some coefficient. So in general, we have c1, c2 plus, C2 minus C3 and epsilon. All these are, at this stage, unknown. And the general solution is the picture. We did learn something up till now. Something that you already said. The solution, what we know about it up till now is you have Exponential decay, exponential decay, oscillation. This is the general structure of the solution. OK, so now um, let us concentrate now on the even solutions. So even solutions. This just means that C2 minus is equal to 0. And it means that C1 equals C3. So the amplitude of this part and the amplitude of this part is the same. So it will be even. And it also means that I can focus on one boundary here because everything else is trivial. And what are the boundary conditions? So the boundary conditions are that the wave function at point A, 
at this point, this is A, is the same as the wave function at region 3 at point A. That is the continuity of the wave function. The, the wave function cannot jump suddenly. And as I showed in previous class, for this type of potentials, also the derivative of the potential is continuous because here I don't have a delta function. Remember, if I had a delta function here, then it would, could jump, but there's not a delta function. So we know from previous class that the derivative, this chupchik is a derivative with respect to x, is the same as the derivative on the other side. What? Well, I, I, this is one, okay, one, whatever. Yes, you're right, I, I made a mistake. This is one. Yeah, this is one, here. I, I, thank you. Okay, so, so now I can go back and I can um, take uh, the derivatives or just use my functions here. So let us do this. So, uh, from the boundary condition of this one, the continuity of the wave function, I have that C1 exponent minus 2me a over h bar is equal to this one, C2 plus, because I'm looking only on the even, cosine 2m v0 minus epsilon square root a, because I'm at, the, at this point, over h bar. <coughs> and if I take the derivative, so what will happen? I have the derivative of this function with respect to x. So it's the same thing multiplied by this prefactor and with a minus sign. Then I have to plug in A because I need a derivative with A. And when I take the derivative of a cosine, what will happen? All this part will come out of the derivative and the cosine will switch to a sine. So you saw such things in the past somewhere, I hope. So this is, I'll do it uh, quickly, is 2m epsilon, taking the derivative here, h exponential, 2m e square root a over h bar c2 plus, and I have a minus because I take the derivative of a cosine, 2m v minus epsilon square root. This is because this is the first derivative, h bar m sine 2m v minus epsilon a over h bar. So here I have two equations and in our problem we are interested in the energies in this epsilon. So I immediately see what will happen now if I divide let's say this equation by this equation, I will cancel out the C's. <coughs> and if I divide, of course, then I also have to divide. So these two C's will end up, and then I'll end up with an equation that gives me the energy levels. Before doing that, I just want to delete this guy, this guy, and this guy. Okay, when I do this, then on this side, this, this is deleted. The minus and the minus are also deleted. So divide the two equations. What will I get from this side? I get square root of E. This is the square root that I got because I took the derivative in space on the boundary. And when I do, divide this, by, this guy by this guy, what do I get? I get 
V0 minus epsilon in the square root. Um, tangents, because sine over cosine is a tangent of all this <coughs> thing, square root. This equation, we'll soon discuss, gives you the energy levels of the even states. There is another equation that you can easily derive for the odd states. I'll ju just write it here. It's not so important for our discussion. V0 minus E, and here you have cotangents, the same thing. A over H bar. These are for odd states, not, not, not to be discussed. So we, we, we just want to focus on these guys. Both of these equations, however, um, I don't know if you are familiar with this type of equation. What type of equation this is? How do you call these type of equations? Do you know? Maybe also that, but tra transcendental equations. It's a difficult long word, transcendent, transcendental equation, because you have a function of E on this side and a function of E on that side. The way you need to look at this equation is, I know what is V0, I know what is the mass, and I know what is A, of course, I know what is H bar. The only thing I don't know here is epsilon. Um, so, of course, for a given set of parameters, these are known for some specific well, and then I need to find these energy levels. So, to solve this equation, you cannot do it uh, easily, or you cannot do it exactly at all, but you can do a so-called graphical method to solve this equation. So, these transcendental equations, um, they are solved in the following way. The first, this is just a, a, a picturesque way. So. I cannot even give you exact expression for these energy levels, but this is not so important for us. I'm just going to show you how in principle you get, then you need actually a computer to solve this. So what you do is you plot uh, the left-hand side of this equation, square root of E. And remember, E as a function of E. I'm looking for E, but now I plot it as a continuous function of E until V0. Anything beyond that is not already a bound state, right? A, a, negative, a, a negative state is, is not a bound state, and if uh, E is bigger than V0, then you get here cotangents hyperbole, and then it's, you're actually lying down here, and that's not part of the game. It, it's, it's not a possible state. So when I plot, you know, okay, plotting the square root of E is very easy. In principle, it looks like this, right? That's the square root of E. Now, what do I do? I take this curve. So this was the left-hand side of the equation, of this equation. Now, what do I do? I use the same curve of the left-hand side. This is V0, this is Epsilon. But now, I also plot on the same curve, I also plot this. So when epsilon is exactly V0, again, that's not the solution. That's just the method of plotting. What is this? This tangent is 0. And then you can easily convince yourself, because this is a sign and cosine. If you go a little bit below, this will go up like this. So it starts here. Now, you don't need, of course, there is a prefactor here. But what happens to the tangents eventually? What will happen to tangents at some point? It will go to infinity, and that will, of course, happen when cosine will go to 0. So the thing is that it's very easy to convince your, yourself that this function is increasing now in this direction, and it will go eventually to infinity, right? So it will go up. 
and you see here there is a point that they cross. What is this point? This is the solution. Because at this point, this energy, I'm going to call it E ground state, or E0, the left-hand side of the equation, which is this curve, and the right-hand side of this equation, they meet. If they meet, they satisfy this condition of equality, and that means that this is the solution. Again, I cannot say to you exactly where this is, but you simply plot these solutions for some parameter, and you find this energy, and that's it. That's the energy. <coughs> what do I learn from this? From here, I can learn already a very general thing. And that is that there is always a solution, at least one. There always exist is a ground state solution always, no matter what. Why? Because if this goes to infinity, it has to cross it somewhere. Because this started at zero, so if you have this curve that's going up here to some finite value, it starts from zero, this guy has to cross it somewhere, right? I mean, this is obvious. So, okay, you have one solution. What does that mean? That there is at least one bound state in this, in this uh, potential, because you see this e ground state, I don't know exact value of it, but it is positive, so there is... least one bound state. And if I want to solve this, well, it, I mean, if I want to find out exactly this energy, then I need to pay the price, and that is I need to plot this. That means I'm not really solving here because I cannot solve it. A, a computer will solve it. But I can do it in principle. It's not a big deal. There is at least one bound state. So the system you have here, and you have here some minus epsilon, one state exists. Now, this first state is the ground state. If you do the same for the odd states, you will see you don't need to have an odd state. Sometimes you have solution and sometimes you don't, depending on parameter. Let us look now, in this solution, when do you have a second solution of, the, of all of these even states? So, how will the solution look like? And in principle, you can have, of course, many. You can have a finite number. It's also nice to say how many you have. Well, you have some finite number. It's very complicated to calculate it. It will depend on all the parameters, but you usually will have a finite number. So let us continue with the plot. So here I have the square root of E, and then I also plot the other part. This is V0. This is uh, epsilon. And I said, OK, I take here. This is the first solution. What will happen after this infinity? What will happen now when I move with the epsilon this direction? Now the tangents will jump to minus infinity after it was plus infinity. And then you will start from here. And you will go up. And what is this solution? That is the second solution of the evens. And of course, in principle, I could have many, but I, I plotted it in such scale that you see only two. But in principle, this guy could be, there could be many points like this, or as you wish. Now I can also see how, how, do, how will I determine if this solution is the only one or out of the even states. I need to look at this point. Let us assume that the, the, this point, if it's positive, then because this guy again goes to infinity, that's the tangents, it goes to infinity, it always crosses this point, right? Because the same as this point, you have here a curve that is going up, this going to infinity, it will cross for sure. Somewhere, it will cross. 
when will it not meet? When this point is here, when this point is negative. If this point, if the next solution would be something like that, then of course, okay, you are not crossing. Okay, you understand this? So what do I care about? I have some, some energy that I don't, it's not an energy, I want to call it um, E, uh, E0, tilde, but with tilde, tilde, it's not an energy state, it's just a condition. Uh, if this energy is negative, then you have only one solution. If, you, if this energy is positive, then you have more than one, I'm not saying how many. So when I use the zero because it's an indication on if it will be a negative, it means that there is only one ground state, right? So the zero is associated with ground state, zero energy, etc. When this guy is less than zero, then only one um, even state that we already proved that it exists for sure. But this guy is easy to find. What is this epsilon tilde? How do you determine it? What is it? What? The tangent is zero, right. Then the pi is you also right. So when this guy is zero, this is what I'm plotting here. These solutions, maybe write it. These things are V0 minus epsilon tangents to M V minus epsilon A over H bar. So this, this zero here, you see the value of this function is zero at this point. This point is uh, given by the condition that this guy is zero. Here, epsilon is V minus epsilon is clearly not zero. And, and then uh, the condition is just given that. And what is the <coughs> condition? If tangents is equal zero, then it means that sine is equal zero. And if sine is equal zero, as uh, she said, the, the, all what you have here inside is equal pi. That would be the first solution. So. What we have here is the condition for epsilon tilde is that t this is the equation for epsilon tilde to m v minus epsilon zero a, a over h bar, this is equal zero. This is this epsilon, which again I emphasize, write it down, this is epsilon tilde this is not an energy state. It's just a mathematical construct, which is defined here. <coughs> so then I uh, just say that 2 m v minus epsilon 0 a over h bar is equal pi. This is with the square root. Now I take the square of this, and I massage it a little bit, and then I get V minus epsilon tilde zero is equal to pi squared over h bar 2m a squared. Of course, as you already saw many times, you see this is a scale of energy, one over length square, length squared, here you have h bar. So this is like momentum squared and mass is uh, the mass. So this is actually like a kinetic energy term. Of course, the pi you could not guess in advance, but this is a typical scale of your uh, problem. So if I want this uh, uh, to be negative, I just move this to the other side. So if uh, V, which is a parameter of the well, this is something that is given by the physics of the particular problem minus h bar pi squared over 2m a squared is less than zero because this is actually this epsilon zero we have 
only one solution of the even ones. Again, in classical world, how many solutions do we have? Let's say V0 is finite. How many states do you have there? Infinite, because it's a continuum of energy. You have an infinite. So when do you have only one? It's in the extreme, I would say, quantum case. You see, in the classical world, H bar is what? Is zero. So V less than zero, then this condition is not satisfied. Because, I mean, V is positive, right? So in the classical world, when you take H bar to zero, then this condition is never met, and you have infinite number of states. That we, that's what we expect. So this, uh, the case where you have one state is a, a very quantum state, in some sense, intuitive sense. So for example, when this, uh, I mean, of course, the condition is always with dimensionless variables that you have potential and here you have energy. But intuitively, when do we get only one step? When mass, in some sense, goes to zero. Right? If mass goes to zero, this is finite. This is what I mean by this. This is finite. Everything else is finite. Then I take my mass smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. I make it tiny. Then what happens? It becomes negative, And then I have one solution one solution. If, in some sense, if H bar would be very big, but okay, let's forget about that. Maybe that's not intuitive. If A, if, if A goes to zero, which means that you have a very thin potential, A to zero, I mean A to zero and all the rest are fixed. I take A smaller and smaller and smaller. Eventually, I'll reach a point where this condition is and so if this is very narrow, you can imagine why you have only one state. Because if it's very narrow, then the, the wave function in the middle, OK, it's here. But it's most of the time tunneling. It's, it doesn't like it so much. Yeah? So, and, uh, so, because then this guy is big. And similarly, if v, uh, if v goes to 0, which means maybe you have something like that, a very small depth, then on all these cases you have only one unique solution. And all this means, what is V0 going to zero? It just means my attraction is very, very weak. I'm attracting, I have a well, but it's, it's, it's nearly not influencing. If it's very weak, then I have only one solution. So if my potential is attracting but very weakly, I'm bounding in one dimension. And I mentioned in the beginning, if I would do the same in three dimension, I would not be bounding if the potential would be weak enough. And again, that is important because in one dimension, if we would live in one dimension, all the molecules that would be attracting a little bit would collapse on one another. But we are not living in one dimension, so you don't need to worry about this too much. We live in three dimensions. That's good news. OK, so you have any questions? If not, let us just summarize all this. It's a general statement, but I do it through a. So, so of course, now I solve this problem in a very particular shape because it's relatively easy. Uh, but the, the, the conclusions are rather general. So. What we have here, uh, uh, let's say, in the classical world and the versus the quantum world, classical, so this is a summary. This is quantum. You have this type of potential. You have infinite number of states, infinite number of bound states. Continu continuity of energy, it's the same thing. In the quantum world, here inside, you have a finite number of states. Finite number 
of bound states. In this lesson, I only focused on the low energy states. I didn't care about the high energy states, but what will happen for a high energy state? Let's say you have an energy, not down here, but up here. So this is small compared to the energy I'm looking at. What will be the solution like? It's very simple. What will it be like? Very high energies. What will be the solution of the Schrodinger equation? What? It will oscillate and very high. It will not care about this blip in the potential because its energy is so high. It will be like a free wave very far away from this thing. So all the states up here are not bound and are oscillatory. The ones that are close here, they, are, they change their wavelength when they see this potential. But very high energies, the change of the wavelength when you cross this region of lesser potential will be very tiny and essentially you will have here free waves. In the classical world, we have a loud region only for bound state. Allowed, forbidden. These are like the old maps of the universe of the world where they say here live the dragons, right? These are the forbidden regions. You cannot go there. Again, only for the bound states. In the quantum states, you have tunneling. But it's not a free world. It's not that you can easily penetrate here. These are decaying exponentially. So when they, if you, you go back and you see you know, what will happen for systems with uh, joule units of energy and masses of kilograms, this decay will be so fast that you will never feel it in the real world that we live in. You need to be with small mass, like an electron in some small system, then you can, then these effects become up. So <coughs> these are not exactly contradictions in the sense of measurement that this just describes different type of uh, world. Uh, let's concentrate on the classical world, so the ground state uh, and the quantum world, the ground state. The ground state is even because the potential is even so how does it look like well you can plot it if you work a little bit harder than what I did I don't like to work too hard and it will look something like this but because I cannot get exactly the energy without doing numerics it's you know to plot this you need to first find the energy by the transcendental equation you find it by numerics, and then you can plug it in when you calculate also the coefficients, and then you can see this. You have to normalize the wave function. You have to do work a little bit to plot it, but essentially, this is decay, this is decay, this is an even state. And it has no zeros. That is, the ground state doesn't... Uh, it, it's always, you can plot it as a function of x, the wave function, and it, let's say always positive. Of course, you could also plot this function as always negative. It's the same thing, because the wave function phi is de defined up to some constant, up to some phase. Here we use just a real thing. The next, ex the next excited state, the first excited state, it's an even state, it always exists. The first excited state, that is the, 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 the next in, in line energy state, will look something like, like that. So you have an exponential decay, and here you have minus exactly the same exponential decay. This is an odd state. And then you have even, odd, even, odd, even, odd, etc., etc. From these pictures of these wave functions, you see that they are orthogonal one to another. Because if, the, if this guy is always positive and it's even, and this guy is an odd function, if you multiply these two functions and integrate over all space, you'll get zero from symmetry. 
So they are orthogonal one to another. You can see this with your eye. And finally, uh, there exists what I call continuum solutions. Continuum is the opposite of discrete, not, not discrete. That's what I mean by continuum. Maybe in a quantum class, discrete, what I mean by that, you have discrete energy levels. These are the quantumness of the quantum mechanics that the energy levels are discrete. But they are also non-discrete. So this spectrum is unique, in, uh, is different than the particle in the infinite well. In the infinite well, all the energy levels were discrete because it was an infinite well. Here you have some energy levels, their number determined by the depth and the width and all these parameters, which are discrete. These are the bound states. But up here, you have infinite, many, many states. And close to every energy state, there is another energy state. And this is exactly like the free wave, because the free wave, the solution is cosine k or EIKX, and then you have a solution with some K, but you have also a solution with K plus delta. So up here you have continuum of continuum solution. Here things are oscillating till a plus and minus infinity. Here things are decaying exponentially. So we have in quantum mechanics, we have actually three classes of spectrums of energy levels. Free particle, only continuous, if there's no potential. Particle in a potential well, finite, discrete energy levels. This case, when you have a finite well, you have both discrete and continuum. What will happen to the hydrogen atom that we're going to learn in the next lesson? We, what will I have here? Discrete energy levels, continuum cell energy levels, or both? Both. You are wrong. Discrete. Discrete, you are right. But that's easy after I said it wrong. <laughs> there was another option. <laughs> that option is not... Continuous. Continuous is not a case. Here we will find only discrete, and essentially it's not maybe, okay, I, I, from your answer I see it's not totally intuitive. What is the fundamental difference between this potential and that potential? Well, it's very simple. This potential goes to infinity pretty fast, like x squared. So it's binding, and we will show that it has discrete energy levels. What happens to the hydrogen atom? Hydrogen atom, the potential, okay, it's three-dimensional. I know we didn't study three-dimensional, but the three-dimensional the, the, the three problem, you have a, a potential. What is the potential? It's attracting between the proton in the center of the hydrogen and the electron. It's attraction. It looks like this in three dimensions, V of R. You know this. Now you'll have, what will you have? Well, you don't need to be a mathematician to solve this. What will you have here? Will they be all bounded, half, half? Okay, so wait till the end of the course. But essentially, you can see that because this potential goes to zero, it doesn't go to infinity here, then you expect that some of the solutions will be continuum and some of them will be bounded. Because bounded means that the potential goes to infinity. I mean, you also more or less know this. I mean, you can break, if you have an electron and a proton, you can break it. If you break it, it means that it's in the continuum state, and so then it can escape to infinity. Otherwise, if it's always bounded, then you could not easily break. I mean, so intuitively also you know this. So anyways, these are the different types of spectrums that we have, uh, mixtures and non-mixtures, and 
slowly you will gain intuition uh, for each problem without solving it you can uh, understand more or less or guess or have an educated guess how will the energy spectrum look like and then we will continue this in the next lesson when uh, after the break when we do the harmonic oscillator yes question We saw that uh, all the all the probability is reflected because uh, you don't have uh, where to go. When the what do you mean? All the probability is reflected. When it uh, went to infinity. Yeah, here it doesn't go to infinity. To, uh, so the well is uh, finite. The well is finite. If, if, okay, so s several. I'll, I'll answer in two ways your your question. What is the physical meaning first of all? So let's say I look at this guy. And then I have here this decay and this decay, which is exponential. Let's say I cool the system and you are in the ground state and I, I, I look where the particle is. So, and I ask, is the particle in the forbidden domain or is it in the allowed domain? So I have a probability in each measurement of position to find the particle here. What is this probability? I take the wave function, I square it, and I integrate. So the probability of finding particle x um, absolute value greater than a that means either here or, or there this is in the ground state or in some eigenstate is simply the integral from minus infinity to minus a phi n squared dx plus the integral from a till infinity, phi n dx, and the point is that this, this is bigger than zero. So you can find the particle in this region. That's the physical meaning of this tunneling. Now you asked also about an infinite well. Okay, if I take this, let's say the, the well is finite, and I take this to minus infinity, then what, you will, what will you get? You will get that the, let's say, so, so what will you get? It's very simple. Let us look at the, uh, it like in a dynamical way. Let's say you start with some potential, with some width, with minus V0. Now I'm going to make it bigger. And now I make it even bigger. I mean deeper. This approaches the infinite well. What will happen to the epsilon? Here, okay, it will be somewhere here, right? Here, it will be somewhere here. What will happen here? It will be somewhere there. So what is happening here? As you make the well deeper and deeper and deeper, approaching the infinite limit, of course in physics there's no infinite limit, yeah, so you make it deeper, this epsilon, which is this distance, becomes bigger. Now what was the decay here? It was exponential minus 2me x over h bar. So when I make this energy bigger and bigger and bigger, this decay is super fast. So here then, uh, I will barely see it. Here I have a bigger tunneling amplitude. Here is something in the middle. These are like the three bears. <coughs> here there's nothing. This is middle. This is a lot. This is more quantum if you want. So, the forbidden energy is decaying with the square root of epsilon. That's, the, that's my point. And of course, now you can say, also here, you have states up here. These states up here, they do penetrate. So, you have many states here, and these guys up here will penetrate more than the, this ground state. This is obvious, because their energy, by definition, is higher. Okay, that's, you, you, that's the question and answer. Good. Sometimes I answer the question and I don't know if that's the question. <laughs> okay, so let us go and take a break for 10 minutes and then we will continue with the harmonic oscillator. Okay, sit down. Yes, what's the question? <laughs> they will not like you later. <laughs> a very general question. Uh, yeah. A classical picture, if we consider a classical small ball, 
enter from region 3 and then region 2 and region 1. We need to consider the time, but in this case, we, we, don't, we don't need to consider the time evolution. We just uh, build the initial state of the particle, right. which is a very global right. probability space. I, I mean, um, so before the measurement, before we observe, observe the particle, it, uh, the particle established its own probability space. And if we imagine a particle, a free particle, and then we suddenly give, give, give it a, a potential well, it should, in principle, it should establish a, a totally new probability space without using time. Okay, so, uh, first of all, all your statements are absolutely correct, but you need to have the mindset of the, in quantum mechanics. So. Also, in, let's start with classical world. You, you are absolutely correct that in classical world, uh, let's say you have some minimum of potential, and you are, a, let's say you are in the lunar park, and you, you, you are sliding down here. Every child knows that eventually you will reach here, but this is because of dissipation. That is, you have friction between the slide, and eventually the boy or the little girl will fall down to this state and find its minimum. And, and this process that I just described now involves friction, it, it involves time, it may be the, where you started, all kinds of things. We did not address this at all in this lecture. We just said, uh, let us look at the, the lowest energy state and find it. And this we did also in the quantum world. Okay? So the, we, I, I had no time. In this lesson I have no time because I solved the time-independent Schrodinger equation. In that sense, you are absolutely correct. And now you can ask, okay, but why do, you, do I care so much about this ground state? This is already already starting to be physics. The, the answer is that if you look at the numbers, let's say, of an electron in a hydrogen atom, which we will learn soon, or more generally, an electron in a, some, some attracting, let's say, in a helium, because you deal with electronic energy levels and compared to temperature, which is not this course, this is the course of stars, you know that if the energy scales, the energy levels uh, are, much, uh, sm are, um, are much larger than the temperature, that means that you are cold, then the system, after many collisions, after a long time, will go to the ground state. And because of the energy scales of, let's say, an electron in the hydrogen atom is so big compared to the temperature that you, even room temperature, it, the usual state that you find the particle in is in the ground state. Of course, so, th and what does this mean? Let's say in this room you have many, avogadro number of hydrogen atoms. I don't mean that all of them are in the ground state, but 0 0.9999999999 of them are in the ground state. Okay? And similarly, in many quantum systems, you, you are in the ground state. Now, it doesn't mean that you cannot uh, excite the system. For example, you can put in energy and then it will start to evolve quantum mechanically. But the, my, my uh, philosophy here was just to find the ground state. I didn't explain how you reach the ground state because that can be very complicated. But, and I'm just telling you that from statistical physics calculations, in most electronic systems of quantum mechanics, you are in a low level system. It doesn't mean all of them. There are many dynamical systems. Okay? So. That's the answer, but essentially I agree with what you say. I mean, I didn't describe how you reach it, I just said you reached it. Okay. Okay, okay so we are solving the harmonic oscillator. So we have a potential V of X, which is a parabola. <coughs> and this is a very well-known problem in classical <coughs> mechanics. This is the spring problem. So you have a restoring uh, force which is linear uh, in the coordinate and then the potential is quadratic. So the potential V of X, we are going to write as one half M omega squared X squared. This uh, M omega squared is usually in Israel at least denoted with the letter K. I don't know how it is in China. But this is the uh, frequency. This is the frequency of oscillations in the classical world. And now we were going to uh, uh, solve this type of problem with the quantum, uh, quantum mechanics. So the classical problem is 
some, some spring that is moving and it has these periodic oscillations. These periodic oscillations have a frequency, omega. And in quantum mechanics, you immediately understand without doing anything, you understand something about the quantum energy scale. If you have a frequency omega in the classical world, you can <laughs> guess more or less what is the energy scale. It's simply h bar times omega. This is similar to what you know from Einstein's work, but Einstein did it on the photon, and now we are doing it on some oscillation. But it will be the same, same thing. The typical energy is going to be h bar omega. This we're going to show. Now, you can ask, okay, this is a spring. This is a, some ma massive uh, particle that, that does oscillation. What is the meaning of a harmonic oscillator in the quantum world? That means we don't uh, want to treat this. If this has, a, let's say, 50 grams, this is not going to be described by quantum mechanics. So the importance of the, of the oscillator in quantum mechanics is the following. If you take, a, for example, you take a two atoms which are bound together. This can be H2 or O2 or N2, so I call it A2. Then these uh, things, they will oscillate like this. These oscillations uh, are like a small spring, but on the level of a molecule composed of two atoms. So these are very small vibrations. And to a good approximation, the potential here, if these oscillations are very small, these oscillations will be described by a harmonic force. The reason is that generically this potential between, this is the distance between the two particles, might look something complicated. It might look something like this. It's also in three dimension, but we will neglect that. This type of potential is a nonlinear field. It's very complicated to solve. It describes here, what does this describe? What is this part? This part describes repul repulsion between the particles. Why do you have repulsion? Because the two atoms, when they come too close, the electrons fall one on top of the other. They like to repel each other. They don't want to sit one on top of the other. On the other hand, you know that these atoms exist in nature. So some distances, you have some attraction. You see here, you have this attraction. And very far away, when they're very far, there's no interaction at all, so this goes to zero as this distance goes. This is a generic potential between two atoms. Of course, the details depend on each atom. It's very different, of course. I'm not plotting here the scale of this thing. Now, where is the oscillator in this problem? Let us assume that the particles are bound. What is a, what is a classical bound particle? The, it means that the, you have some minimum of the potential. This is this R mean. And the particles are here, and that would mean that there is a special di distance between the particles, and the particles are just sitting there. In reality, they are sitting there, but they are oscillating a little bit. And that, uh, if the oscillations are small, then I, I take this real potential, and then I approximate it around this point by a parabola. And this is actually true both in classical and in quantum mechanics. When people taught you in school that there is a spring and the force is linear, do, did you believe them? Well, good, you didn't believe them. But what does it mean, actually? It means the force is linear within some range of displacements of the oscillator. If you go too far away, if I take the spring, the classical one, and I pull it, it will break, right? So, of course, if it will be pulled very far, then you will have nonlinear effects. Exactly the same thing happens in quantum mechanics, but now we are talking about atoms. So, if you look at the vibrations of this guy, of course, beyond vibrations, you have vibrations that these guys are moving. You have translation that this system is moving all together. You have also rotation. You have many uh, motions together here and many spectrums. But this spectrum associated with this uh, Spectrum I mean that you measure these energy levels associated with discreteness that you find here. You find some energy levels associated. These are the vibrational energy levels that you can measure, for example, with spectroscopy. 
you put in a photon that puts it from up here to here, it starts to vibrate, then after some time it loses its energy, etc. This is not electronic energies, these are vibrations. So you can measure it, I'm not going to the detail how you measure it. This is done in every chemistry laboratory around the world, this energy spectrum. And my, my, my main point is that you understand this very complicated potential is to a good approximation at low enough energies in harmonic oscillator. That, so if I solve the harmonic oscillator, I immediately know something about the energy levels or the, of this system down here. This is the, the, the physical motivation of this. So we want to solve this problem and the next um, um, the next uh, maybe two hours or so. So we will start it now and uh, we will solve this problem in all the glory detail with all the details. To solve the problem, I mean, we would like to solve, this is our aim, uh, we want to find the energy levels of the oscillator, of the harmonic oscillator in one dimension. So the potential is, the, the, the Hamiltonian is one over m minus h bar squared two over two m, the usual kinetic energy term, the second derivative. And now I choose this very special potential, m omega squared x squared, all this times phi n, equal e n phi n. So again, I'm interested in the stationary solutions, not the time-dependent problem. If I know this, then in principle, if I have some initial state, I can do the superposition of many states depending on the initial condition, but this is time-independent Schrodinger equation, which is now being solved. Um, to solve this type of equation, we go through a set of uh, procedures that are very general. And the first one is, let us make or let's put it this way, work with dimensionless variables. The issue here, this is a very simple state. The, the, from unit's point of view, we have in this problem, we have the frequency, we have the mass, we have h bar. These are three units three physical uh, objects that have different units. So we can create length scales, we can create velocities, etc. So the idea is, let us not carry along all these uh, uh, informations. We have also an energy scale, I said already, h bar omega. So let us not carry along with us all these uh, symbols all along. Let us go to dimensionless units because the math is going to be somewhat extensive. And if I carry with me all the time all these units, I'm bound to do some mistake along the way. So to do so, um, I, I gain simpler, uh, a simpler mathematical representation, but I also gain the typical scales of the problem. And it's very easy to see that the quantity y, which I'm going to use, which is uh, m omega over h bar times x, the units of y are the same as a natural number 1, that means that y is dimensionless. So this object here is one over one over meter. So x, and this is the scale of the length scale of the problem in some sense. So, and this is a easy to say, let's say, let us look what are the dimensions of y, then you have m, which is, a, let's leave it as m, then omega, that's as units of t. Then you have uh, h, that's energy times t all this square root times position. This is only units. So e energy is uh, m x squared over t squared. So you see this immediately t squared m x squared over t squared times x. This is units of one because this nicely cancel out the square root of x squared with this and these two things cancel. So indeed, y is dimensionless. 
it follows that the second derivative of x squared is given by h bar m omega second derivative of y. Here I'll have m omega squared, and then I need to multiply it, so it here will be m omega h bar. And on the other hand, the, this x squared that I have here, as it, so x squared is simply h bar over m omega y squared. So. If I do this simple uh, exercise and I plug it into the Schrodinger equation, all I get is minus h squared over 2m. Um, here I have m omega over h bar squared, no, h bar, sorry, d over dy squared plus uh, half m omega squared, now I need to do this x squared, h squared, m omega y squared, equal e, all this, I need to multiply, of course, by the wave function, this is equal e times phi. And then, what is the nice thing about this? Well, it's only that this m cancels. That's good. So now I don't need to carry m with me all along. And this square of this h will be this h. Um, and here I have a mistake. This is h. Um, this is h because it, this is also a mistake. Because this is the square of this thing in the inverse. So also this guy goes and also this guy goes and what do you see that is remaining is h bar times omega, h bar times omega, and this is, has dimensions of energy. So if I divide everything by h bar, omega, and I multiply it by 2, then I get this uh, uh, equation, and then I move this to the other side, then I get 0 equal to second derivative of y phi plus 2e over h bar omega minus y squared times phi. It's slightly simpler than the original equation, I hope you agree. And you immediately see that E over H bar omega is dimensionless. Uh, what do you see here? What is this? This comes from the second derivative in space. This is the kinetic energy term. Y squared, that is the, simply the potential. I assumed it, it's a harmonic oscillator, that's why we have a Y squared. And I have here this uh, simple thing, and you see the sign here is plus and here is minus, and that's also easy to understand because you have the minus in the kinetic energy and the plus in the potential, so these are negative opposite signs, and I just moved them to the other side of the equation. So I want to solve this equation. And now we're going to start doing that. How, how do you start solving these type of equations? Do you know? After turning them into dimensionless, what's the next stage? You know or don't? What? Yeah, the general method is going to be a, a, a series. Did you say Fourier series? Then it's no. It's going to be a series. It's not going to be Fourier. It's going to be a series, yes, a series expansion. Um, uh, asymptotic series expansion. Nothing to do with Fourier. Actually, the solution of this is related to a function called Hermit that we will find. 
But the second, the, 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 okay, after taking dimensionless, then the second set is, let us look at the asymptotic solution. You see, at the beginning, when I want to solve this type of equation, what do I do first? I, I first do the easy things. Turn it into dimensionless and look at the asymptotic solution. What does it mean, asymptotic solution? It means I, I want to take y to be big. y to infinity. It doesn't matter, plus infinity or minus infinity. In that case, what do you get? Then you get the second derivative of phi. You see, this y is much bigger than this energy. This energy is some number. Let's say we, we know it. Let's say this is the ground state, or the first excited, or the, the, 200, the 200 state. It's some number. This is some number. If I go to y big enough, y is going to be bigger than this energy term. And then I can neglect this, so I write it like y squared phi. Um, what are the solutions of this guy? Can you see what are the solutions? Asymptotic solutions, not exact solutions, actually. Can you see what are the solutions? Phi of y. So when I write this curve, I mean in the limit of large y, neglecting all kinds of stuff, is exponential plus or minus y squared over 2. So soon I'll show you. But it's easy because if I take a derivative, I'll get y. And then I take another derivative, I'll get an another y. Uh, y what? Um, just the y will, will not give you this y square here. So soon we'll see it. But if I had it just y, then the derivative will give you phi. Then this y square is much bigger than this solution. You want a solution that the prefactor will give you y square as well. But so, so, soon, we will, soon we will show it. it. It's very easy. But let us assume that these are the, these are the solutions. Uh, I have here a plus and I have a minus. Immediately one of them is a good solution and one of them is a bad solution. The good solution is the minus one, because that means that far away in the tail, you have here some exponential decay, no, Gaussian decay. Gaussian, I mean, because this is y squared. As you so remember, in the previous lesson, we had y. This was because we had a flat potential. Now this potential goes to infinity, so it goes like y squared here. Does this make physical sense? Why is this physical? What does it mean? So again, if I had before the class, I had this guy, and we said here it goes like minus x, right? And here it goes like minus x, with some prefactors. Here it's stronger, because y squared is bigger than x squared. Let's say both of them are the same. Why is it here decaying faster compared to here? What is the physical intuition? The potential rises, as you say, exactly, very good. It, it rises here very steeply, and then you tunnel into these regions, but it's very unclassical to go to a region where the potential is very high and you manage to go inside into this forbidden region. And that's why these guys decay faster than these guys, because this was flat. If I had here a steeper potential, let's say an infinite potential well, you know what will happen. An infinite potential well, nothing would go inside. So, okay, th this already tells you something about the solution. It's very vague, maybe, but without doing anything, you know this. Now, why is this mathematically the solution? In what sense? First of all, when I mean this, it actually can be also y to the, some power of r, but the point is like this, that when I take the derivative of y, and y is big, then I, I get y e to the minus y squared over 2. You see, that's why we have the two. When I take the derivative, this two and two cancel, and then I have this y. Then if I take the second derivative of y, then I get, when I take this one again, then I get y squared, e minus y over two. And here, of course, then I can take this derivative, but these are smaller corrections. So I'm throwing them away. Smaller terms. But the point is that this, 
because I'm working at very large y, then this is very big, because here you have this y squared in front. y is 1 billion. 1 billion squared is much bigger than this, this guy. What will be the next guy? It will be, for example, if I take the derivative here with y, it will be the same thing times 1 instead of 1 billion to power 2. So all what is here I'm throwing away, and this guy is exactly y squared times phi, and you see here that they cancel out. So to the leading order, the leading order solution, big Y, it's this thing, but I didn't really say anything about the prefactor. Okay, so this is some uh, intuitive uh, explanation. So now what I can do is, okay, now I will define um, what I call now, um, I'll guess a solution. It's a guessing solution. It's not really a guess. It's a, a really just postulating some form of solution. Let us assume that phi of y is some function u of y e to the minus y squared over 2. Uh, so this is guess a solution. It's not really guessing. It's just changing the problem. We had a problem to find phi. Now we will have a problem to find u. That's all. So the, the only thing that we know here is that this function, because this is the l large y behavior, that this function, what do you expect of it? You know something. It, 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 will, it will not increase like a Gaussian, like e to the y squared, because if it increases like a Gaussian, then it will win over this guy. This is the only thing you know. You know that it has to be well behaved at large y in order for this guy to be dominating at large y. Now I want to work not approximately, not asymptotically. I want to do it exactly so. I have to take the derivatives carefully. So the first derivative of phi, this is the first derivative of phi, is the first derivative of u e minus y squared over 2, that is equal to u tag. The tag is the derivative with respect to y. Uh, e to the minus y squared over 2. Then I take the derivative of this guy. Then I, I get y. This is the internal derivative with a minus sign. u times e to the minus u over 2. That means that this is u prime minus u e minus y squared over 2. But in the Schroeder equation over here, I don't need the first derivative. I need the second derivative with respect to, to y, which is a pain. But OK, I have to do it. I, I need to take another derivative. Let's operate on this guy. Then you'll have u double prime e minus u squared over 2. Then you'll have minus y u prime e minus u squared over 2. So I took this derivative. Then I have, oh my goodness, this u e minus u squared over two, y squared over 2. This is this guy. Then I have minus y u prime e minus u squared over 2. Then I have, then I take this guy. Then I have plus y u e minus y squared over 2. Well, it's very obvious, and it was obvious from the beginning, that these exponentials will appear everywhere. Because this is the magic of exponentials. You take the derivative of an exponential, it will remain an exponential. So this guy I can summarize. You have here the second derivative, this guy. And you see here I have the same term. So it's minus 2y u prime. Then I have minus u, if I did not make a mistake, and then plus yu, all this e to the minus y squared over 2. I made a mistake because um, here is y squared. Because when I... I add a y u, and then I take the derivative with respect to this guy, gives me another y. So here I have u y squared. And this is correct. Of course, this y squared is important. 
Okay, now I need to plug this guy into the Schrodinger equation, and you will see that you see this this is the second derivative, and you see that this exponential factor will cancel with the u times this uh, thing. So um, if I want to do that, then I'll get the following. I'll get u double prime. This is this term. I'm just taking the kinetic energy term now. Minus 2y u prime minus, how do I want to write it? Yeah, minus u plus u squared, y squared u, that's this term. This is equal to 2e over h bar omega. This is this term. Minus y squared times u equals 0. And I canceled out already this exponential factor for both sides. And the nice thing here is you see that this term and this term, you have a plus minus square. Here it's a y squared, like this one here. So these two guys are canceling each other. And then I reach an equation which I can also take this u and plug it in here, then I get this equation, I want to write it like this. d over dy squared u minus 2y u, the, deriv the first derivative. So let's write it explicitly. And then I have plus 2e over h bar omega, dimensionless energy this is minus 1 times u equals 0. And this is the equation I want to solve. Let us call this equation 3. You ask me where is 1 on 2? I don't, I don't mind. You can put it somewhere. <laughs> it's 3 in this notebook. Maybe we'll, we'll need it soon. Okay, now what we need to do? What do we need to do? Someone mentioned this. What do we need to do? We do the serious expansion. We assume that there is a Taylor expansion of the function u of y. You can expand it, and this expansion will give you a polynomial. The polynomial, hopefully, will be a finite polynomial, not an infinite polynomial, but maybe it will be an infinite one, who knows, but later we will see it is a finite polynomial which is excellent, we will find that polynomial, essentially. So, but I taught you a trick, right? So what is, what is the expansion? I mean, you have u of y. So I already taught you one trick the previous lesson, and I mean last week, and that is that we have odd and even solutions. So, you see I like this trick. And this is because also here V of X is equal V of minus X because you have a harmonic potential. It means that you have harmonic potential, you have a symmetry. Plus X and minus X are the same. So, if we have odd and even solutions, let us focus on the even solutions. You know, I'll leave you something. You can do the odd ones. I will not solve the odd ones here, but it's exactly the same method, and you just need to work everything out. If you have the even solutions, what does it mean? It means that u of y is, in principle, you can Taylor expand it. So even solution means that u of y equal u of minus y. For example, the ground state is going to be something symmetric. So the u of y multiplied by the exponential will look something like that. So it's an even function. <coughs> this is the ground state. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write this as a Taylor series. A um, s y to the power s. This is called the serious, not serious as opposite of a young guy, but serious as a serious expansion, serious method. What is our aim? Our aim is to find these ASs and of course to find the energy. If we find these ASs, we are done. 
Now, okay, to find the AS, we need to use the tool in equation three. And in equation three, we have the derivatives with respect to y and the second derivative with respect to y. So I need to know what is this derivative with respect to y, right? So let us do that. You put, you do it tidy. You do it tidily. You had a comment? No, I thought someone was mumbling something. Okay, so what is the first derivative? Okay, d dy u is equal to, I just take the definition, is a sum from s equals zero to infinity. I'm not saying that some of the as's are not zero. It will turn out later that some of the as's are zero, which is good. We don't like these infinite series. Um, AS, and then I take the derivative, so here I have 2S, Y, 2S minus 1. And what is the second derivative of U? This is sum AS, 2S minus 1 times 2S, Y, 2S minus 2. So each time I take a derivative, I have minus 1, and then I have minus 2, and I take the prefactor, as you all know from simple derivatives. So, so now, I, what do I need to do? I need to call this equation 4 and this equation 5. And I take 4 and 5 and I plug it into 3. Because here again we have these two expressions. It's a technical step, but let's do it. It will be a long line, but okay. sum here is from 0 to infinity. So let us write it. I'm writing now the second derivative with respect to y. s equal infinity. I just copy it from here. a s times 2s 2s minus 1 y 2s minus 2 because it's the second derivative so I had here the minus 2. Now I need to do this minus 2 sum s from 0 to infinity. Now I need the first derivative. So I have a s times 2s y 2s. You see I have here a y and here I have a minus 1 because of the derivative. So y times y minus 1 I get 2s. Then I have this term and this term, these two terms, these are easy, these are 2a over h bar omega minus 1 and then I have the sum s to infinity a s, that's the definition of u y to power 2s all this should be equal to 0 now I notice here that I have two types of terms. Here I have 2s minus 2, here I have y to the power 2s, and here I have y to the power 2s, right? So I just want to rearrange it and I want to bring these two guys together because these two guys are proportional to one another. Uh, and if you do that, then you get the following. This I leave unchanged. This is sum of s equals 0 to infinity, as, 2s, 2s minus 1, y 2s minus 2 uh, and here I want to write it with a plus so s 0 to infinity so a plus means I'm taking first this term so I have here 2 e over h bar omega minus 1 and here I have 2 times 2 2 times 2 you see quantum is easy it's 4 <laughs> This is 4, and I need to multiply it by this s. Then I have all this parenthesis is closed, and I have a s y to the power 2s, and this is equal 0. Now, here I have something annoying, um, because here I have this 2s minus 2, and here I have this 2s. But you have to think about this a little bit. This is an infinite sum. 
So let, let's say uh, S here is uh, 322, this is some number. Do you have the same uh, power of the exponent also here? Of course you have it also here, because here you have all the exponents running from S equals 0 to infinity, and here you have most of them, notice that when S is equal to 0, then this is gone. There's no S equals 0 here. There's no Y minus 2 here, because this S kills it. So we are going to just change the labels in such a way that this guy will be similar to this guy. That's all. It's just a changing of the labels. And to do that, I'm just going to write a, a new label, K plus 1, equal S. Why do I do that? I have, that means that 2k plus 1, which is minus 2, is simply 2k. So up here I'll have 2k. So here I have sum. Okay, so here there's a, a slight, small, small, small issue. Notice that s equals 0 is not included in this sum, so I can start the sum from 1. If I can start the sum from s equals 0, from actually from s equals 1, what is the meaning of the first k? The first k is equal 0, because the first s here, because of this guy, is 1. So here I have k equals 0 to infinity, and here I have, uh, how do I want to, I want to write it not like that. Yeah, I'll write it like this. Okay, so here I have uh, 2 times k plus 1. This is simply this 2s. I just plugged in k plus 1 instead of s. And 2s minus 1 is I have 2k plus 2 minus 1. So here I have 2k plus 1. And here I have y to the power 2k, as I said before. And I forgot the a k plus 1. So here I have a k plus 1. Plus exactly the same thing. So This is simply this guy. But now I have here a sum of k, and I like s more than k, then I'm going to change this back to s. I'm just going to call it s. And then you'll have the same thing. Of course, I could do the same. I could change this to k. It would be the same thing. So doing so, I get the, I want to leave this. Maybe I'll write it here. If I need it later, I'm not sure. No, I don't think so, but whatever. So just to summarize this point, after switching back to S, I get the following equation. Sum from S zero equals 0 to infinity, to infinity, open up the brackets to S plus 1. This is simply this instead of KS. 2 S plus 1. Um, a s plus 1 plus 2 e h bar omega minus 1 minus 4 s a s close the brackets what did I leave out y to the power 2 s all this is equal 0 Now, it's pretty horrible equation, but you see here, what do I get? I get some numbers, complicated numbers, times y to power 0. That was from s equals 0. Then y to the power 2, then y to the power 4, y to the power, 
etc., etc., etc. How will this equation be always satisfied no matter what is y? I can choose y. I can choose y to be any number from minus infinity to plus infinity. That is simply the position of the part, the, 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 the value of the space on which I'm calculating the wave function. So y can be anything. If y can be anything and it needs to be solved for every y, this means that this equation must be solved for each s independently one of one another. That means that this guy is going to be zero for all s. This is nice. Because if this guy, I'm, I'm, all this, is going to be zero without the sum, so you're summing zero plus zero plus zero, etc. Then what do I get here? I get a connection between AS plus 1 and AS. That is called the recursion relation of the problem. So let us write it here. For each S so I'm not, it's very easy. So what, uh, what would I like to have? I'd like to have a, a s plus 1 in terms of a s. I, I do the recursion. I start, let's say, at a0, then I get a1, then I get a2, then I get a3, etc. So I want to start with the lower one. So what do I need to get a s1? I need to take this guy and divide it by here. So the recursion relation is a s plus 1. is linear in a AS, but now you need to take all these prefactors minus 4S, and you need to divide by what you had here, 2S plus 1, 2S plus 1. So what is the trick here? I know a0. How will I get eventually a0? You know? What? I can't hear you. Not boundary condition. We used already the boundary conditions by taking the solution which goes like exponential minus y squared over 2 and not the plus 1. We use that. You are not allowed to use things twice because that's overuse. You use the boundary conditions already? What didn't we use? How will you get a, a, a zero? What? I can't hear you. No initial conditions, because it's a time-independent Schrodinger equation. You have the ground state, let's say, the excited state. There's no, there's no time in this problem here. Yeah, h phi equal e phi. So how do I get a zero? Yeah, but I need to put in something. What I mean by that is, you see, this equation, you need to put in something to get the next one. Right, right. That's, that's what I'm saying. Uh, how? How do you know what is A0? So you know the solution up to a zero. That means you don't know the solution. You know the solution up to a multiplicative constant. That's what you suggest. That's a mathematic mathematician. But we are talking about physics, because the wave function has a meaning. It has a condition on it. Exactly. Good. So the wave function eventually has to be normalized. That is phi squared. Let's say phi zero, phi s, some phi s. Absolute value integral has to be equal one, because this has a physical meaning of probability density. So that will determine A0. But she's absolutely right. At this stage, we don't know what is A0. At the end, we're going to normalize. So we are not worried that we put in some A0. At the end of the day, we will get. Where is a minus? Uh, yeah, there's a minus. You're absolutely right. Sorry. Sorry, because, yeah. So. This is a machine that you take a zero, you get a one, you get a two, you get a three. Of course, uh, mathematicians in the 19th century did this work for us. They 
solve this equation. The guy called Hermit long before quantum mechanics was uh, discovered. And he solved this equation. This maybe is the way he solved it. And he found these coefficients, one after the other. He sat down and calculated them, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, but you can see how, in principle, this is done. Now, said that, I still don't know what is the energy. So up to now, it's still formal. I don't know what is energy. What is energy? So I cannot really use that. But if I know the energy, let's say I measure it, then I can use it. But Okay, and this guy will be determined at the end of the day from normalization. So, for example, A1 is 1 minus 2E over H bar omega over 2A0, etc. Yes. Uh, you need to solve it twice because uh, now you took the even, uh, you took the even solution. Yeah. So you, you need to do it again for the other solution. All the process that I gave you now, you need to do it by yourself because I cannot feed you all the solution. I yeah. feed you half of the solution. Yeah, you need to do it, and then you'll get a different recursion relation, something similar. So when I get the other. But this is not a lot of work. When I put the odds, so it's not A0, it's A1. No, no, no. You, 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 will, you, you will also have A0, A1, A2. But if you want, you can add here. These are only the plus solutions all along. Then you'll have also recursion relation for the minus solution. That's the odd solutions. But I, I don't want to carry with me so many uh, indexes. You start, you have a new page, and you start the calculation from the start, and you do it. Uh, I mean, you know, you know what happens eventually, because eventually, for example, for the ground state, what is A0? There's only A0 and there's nothing else, because the, the exponential is solution. And then the, 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 the odd solutions, I mean, it's very difficult to say this. I mean, I, I, you have to define yourself, because, I mean, remember, for example, the ground state of the even states was e to the minus y squared over 2. The, the first energy level of the odd states is something like y e minus y squared over 2. Both of these concepts are determined by normalization. Now, the odd solution has only odd parts. Yeah, so it's not trivial, the, 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 but there is a relation, and what is, the, what is the relation? I mean, there is a connection between them. The connection comes from the fact that the odd solutions and the even solution have to be orthogonal to one another. So if you take, let's say, an odd solution and you take an even solution and you multiply them and integrate from minus infinity to infinity, you'll get all these numbers, right? These prefactors, A1, A2, A3 of both the odd, and they will be multiplying each other, right? So you will need... Um, you will need, uh, you will get some connections between the numbers, but it's not really physical or not, mean, not really meaningful because the, 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 these are odd and these are even, yeah? So, okay. So, let us, uh, okay, so, so now I have this. Now, it, it all looks very promising. But actually, there is a problem here. It's a problem that actually, when you solve it, everything is even better. Let us be dramatic a little bit and say, oh, this is awful. And then we'll see. Why is this not good? Let us look. Um, so, and I'll call this the amputation. I guess there is a better word in English. Amputation is when you take off your arm or something. If you take off your leg of some guy, amputation. Well, we have here a problem. What is the problem? Let us look what happens for large S. Then you have AS plus 1. Well, you see this number S is big. This number is some number, 22.34, whoever, we don't care. This S is very big. 
So here I have four S. What do I have downstairs? The one and the one, who cares about them when S is big? Two and two is four. Four and four will cancel. So what will this expression be? This is going to be uh, AS over S, which another way to write it is AS plus one over S, AS goes, goes like, which means at large S, it goes like one over S. Isn't it S squared? Here I have S squared, but on top I have S. So S over S squared is one over S. So I claim this is not so good. Why is it not good? Yes, it's not convergent, and let us be more specific. What, what, what is the solution, or what is this solution telling us? It's some, something is peeping up. Could, can anyone say? Maybe you can. What is going to happen? What, what is the solution that this, this guy is giving you? You know? It's not convergent, but how exactly? What did we do at the start? We threw away something. What did we throw away? We threw away the, the term that explodes at plus infinity, the e to the min plus y over y squared. We threw it away. But now this solution comes back to us. It, it wants to exist mathematically. It comes back. So and let me show you that this is indeed the case. And the way I show it, or the way I convince myself that this, this is A, not convergent, as he said, and B, it's exactly doing what you actually, when you think about it, is expected giving you the divergence at, at infinity, let us look at this solution, y squared. This is a function e to the y squared. Why do I do y squared and not y squared over 2? OK, think about it, but soon I'll give you the answer. But y to the power 2 to the power s, s equals 0 to infinity over s factorial. What did they do here? This is the Taylor expansion of the exponential. This is the infinite series of the exponential. Let us call this series some alpha s y to the power 2s. The alpha s, you see, it's an even function because I add y squared. It's trivial. What happens in the limit s to infinity to alpha s plus 1 over alpha s. What does it go like? Well, I know what is alpha s. What is alpha s? Is 1 over s factorial. What is, no, excuse me. It's alpha s is 1 over s factorial. What I said was correct, but I need to divide it. So it's s factorial over s plus 1 factorial, right? Because th these guys, 1 over s is this, this guy simply said this is, when s is big, this goes like 1 over s plus 1. But 1 is negligible compared to s. This goes like 1 over s. So you see that the, the series that we got is behaving the same way as this series at very large y. It means that it's not a convergent series. And it gives you exactly this e to the y squared. Why y squared and not y squared over 2? Because remember, what is the solution? You have phi equal e minus y squared over 2. This guy now, at this stage, goes like y squared minus y squared over 2. This goes like e to the plus y squared over 2. And this was the solution that I threw away at the beginning. Remember, when I did the asymptotic term, I had either plus or minus, and I told you we're going to throw away the plus. Here is the solution. This, this is what we threw in the garbage. We neglected. We threw it in the garbage because it's not normalizable, it's not physical, it's not good for us. So, oh my god, so okay, let us do something all from the beginning. 
but what is the trick now? So we have a problem, and how do, how do we avoid this problem? Exactly, you want in some sense that this S will not really go to infinity, that for some given energy, the number of terms in your polynomial will be finite. How would that be possible if this factor in the recursion relation for some E and some S will be zero? Let's say you have here the number 26. Here we have one plus four times 26. I can choose an energy in such a way that it will stop here. This term will be zero and then AS plus one will be zero and then I'm fine. Then there's no problem. So what does it mean? The boundary condition at far away gives you diverging solution. Physically, it cannot be possible that we have it. So it's a boundary condition. It pops up in the solution and then we, we say um, we want to amputate the, the series. There is a finite series and this guy is going to be zero upstairs here and then you'll have a finite number of coefficients, everything. And that means a finite polynomial, not an infinite series. This is very good. So to do that, so uh, to avoid con divergence or to encourage convergence, it's the same thing. So to avoid divergence of the series, I to kill the, the exploding solution at y to infinity, energy levels E are quantized. Specifically, we'll have to demand that there exists some R R is an integer, uh, 0, 1, etc. 1, 2, 3. These Rs eventually are the energy, the, the quantum number of the energy levels. Each, quant uh, each energy level, you have the ground state, then you have the second excited state, the fourth excited state. I, I didn't say the first and the third. Why? What is the first and the third one? These are the odd guys, so this only gives you zero energy level, second excited state, fourth excited state, sixth excited state, etc., till infinity. So these are these quantum numbers. Later we will change them to n when we also include the n. Then you have that this energy now depends on some specific r. There are many of them, these r's. H bar omega plus one plus four R, all this equals zero, or ER, I just solved this equation, it's easy. I just move this, multiply by H bar omega is equal to H bar omega 2R plus half. So R here is the quantum number of the even states. It's quantized, it's an integer. And you see if these are the energy levels, you start the recursion relation, and then you get for S equal R, this stops, it's dead, and then, so the bigger R, the more terms you have in the polynomial in front of this exponential, right? The more complicated the polynomial is. For example, if R is equal zero, how many terms do you have in the polynomial? You have one term, A0. And then the asymptotic solution is also, and that is exactly the ground state. So what do we see from this solution? And here we will end.
more or less. So what we see up to now. We see that the energy levels are quantized in the following way. I plot the potential. What is the lowest energy level? Lowest energy level is R equals zero. The lowest energy level is H bar omega over two. This is the ground state energy. like the particle in the infinite potential well, or like the particle in the finite trap, right? The energy level wasn't minus V0, it was a little bit above it. This epsilon we talked about previously, also particle in the box, the lowest energy level was it at the bottom of the potential. So here is the classical energy, and because of uncertainty, the energy is a bit higher because what, what, what is happening here, actually? The particle, if it would be here, the classical ground state, it would be a delta function in phi. But that means that its kinetic energy is gigantic, and then it's not a ground state. So it's a compromise. The particle here is spread out in such a way that you minimize the energy. This is the lowest energy. But it cannot be localized, and you cannot get the zero energy that you have in the, the, the ground state of the classical system. So it's a bit above it because it's a bit spread. Because once you have some, let's say this is the solution, this is the wave function, once it's a little bit spread, it means it's sometimes also in these regions in space. So it means that its energy is not zero because it samples the, you know, the part of the, of the potential where the potential is not zero. So of course the energy is higher, right? Then the next, uh, the next state here is given by R equal 1. What is the energy level? It's 5 over 2 h bar omega. So this difference is 2 h bar omega. And you see that this 2 h bar omega is the same. It, it continues like that forever. The next state. is 7 over 2 h bar omega. This difference is 2 h bar omega. 9 over 2. Yeah, sorry, right. Again, these are only for the even solutions. What will happen in reality? Okay, let us look at the uh, ground state. Let us use the recursion relation, which I deleted, so it's a bit of a pity. But let us find now the r equals zero. What are the wave functions? So r equals zero, this is the quantum number. Then phi of y, here I add a number, zero. This is the quantum number. The wave function is associated with a quantum number, so r equals zero. This is the r equals zero. This is equal some a zero exponential minus y squared over two. It's easy to use the recursion relation for this choice of r to show that you have only one term. And this is why I plotted this, the ground state is a Gaussian. This is the potential, and I plot the ground state on it. It's a simple Gaussian. What will happen for r equal 1? Then phi r equal 1, which I don't like so much, r equal 1. Let's write it r 
equal zero and r equal one. The reason is that later on we'll change it to n, we will have also the n one. So to write r equal zero, r equal one explicitly. This is the solution, let us write it. It's a zero, one, two y squared exponential minus y squared over two. And a zero, as I said before, you need to do nasty integrals. You need to take, for example, this function, square it, do the integrals. A lot of homework assignments, how to do that. This wave function um, is, is also, um, it's also even. I mean, um, it, it, it's an even a uh, wave function. Let us look now how I get this, uh, this two. So this two, this two, this two times a zero, this is what I called before a one. Remember, what is a one? A one is the coefficient of y squared. Because I have a s times y to the power two s. S is equal one, this is a one. So, so let us uh, remember how we did it. If you go back to the recursion relation, we had half, one minus two e over h bar omega a zero. This is one, this is zero, and I just use the relation between a s plus one and a zero. So this is a one and zero, that means I chose here s equals zero. I know, however, what is the energy level? What is the energy level? Five over two h bar omega. So A1 is half, one minus two, five over two, and H bar omega will cancel, A0, and that is minus two, A0. You see here that I did this small calculation just to show you how I got this minus two. And similarly, you can do more and more and more for other wave functions, from our, for, for other uh, solutions. So this comes from the recursion relation. Okay, so here we will stop. The solution for the even states, for the odd states is you, you get energy levels here in between. And also for them, the distance is 2 h bar omega. That means that the distance here is h bar omega. What we will do in the next lesson, we will briefly summarize all the properties of the wave functions in space that we got now. I'll just give you the final solution, which means that we will tidy up these polynomials. These are Hermit polynomials. We'll just give you the equations, and then we will give you the final solution. That is, we'll simply announce what are these normalization constants, and then you will have, and you can find it in any textbook, you will have all the wave functions of the harmonic oscillator starting from the ground state till infinity, given in terms of these polynomials, which are called Hermit polynomials. These are tabulated. You don't need to remember them, you, but you can easily plot whatever you want. You know, these Hermit polynomials are as famous as exponentials or cosines or sines. If you use a program like Mathematica or MATLAB, you can easily plot all the solutions. So this is what we will do at the beginning of next lesson. So please uh, read, maybe read uh, what we did now if it was not clear. Uh, do the odd solutions, try to repeat. And after that, we will continue and solve this problem again, but with a totally different method. Uh, based on creation and uh, annihilation operators. So this will be a method based on matrices. I will not solve any differential equation. There will be no differential equation. There will be only linear algebra. This is also given, for example, in Cointanuji, uh, but in nearly any textbook. And here we are using a method with creation and annihilation operators. While this method, I think you saw this method somewhere in the past. I mean, you know the serious method, I think, is not new for you. What? Yeah. 
you saw, you, you saw it in the past, so this is traditional method. The operator method uh, is much more elegant in some sense. It was given by Dirac much later. So maybe read uh, in Cointonogy on this creation and operator method, so you will be ready, because there the tools will be very different than here. Okay, so I'll see you next week, and um, thank you very much.